very grateful to Ambassador Shapiro and his staff uh, for making today's presentation to you all possible. Although I've spent most of my career in the field of anti-money laundering and anti-terrorism in global financial institutions, it was during the financial crisis that I began to step back and reevaluate the role I could play in the lives of my children and any wider contributions I could make to improve our world. While my life has seemed to, be, seemed to me to be fairly normal and ordinary, I have been told countless times over the years that I was anything but normal. So in 2008, I began to collect those countless moments and write them down. From them, I discovered a theme and even a purpose that took me in a different direction than solely the fight against money launders. Still an important fight, by the way. It started, though, with simple recollections and a series of realizations like the following. Meg, weren't you afraid? The question came from my close friend, Jessica, in our law school's library in downtown Manhattan. It was the end of our first year, with final exams fast approaching. I had been procrastinating, preferring to share with Jessica stories of my childhood, living abroad with my family in Iran, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, and Israel. Jessica was captivated by my story of living in Cairo at the time when Sadat was assassinated, and in Pakistan when General Bhutto was hung. But she was Jewish, like me, and was most interested in my description of October 1973. I was only four, living with my parents and two brothers, one older and one younger. We had an apartment in Beta Karim. The Yom Kippur War broke out, and I just remember playing in the bomb shelter, and now Daniel gave it up. I didn't put it in the speech, but yes, with, with Ambassador Shapiro. He was not the ambassador at the time. <laughs> In the moment, I thought about Jessica's question and closed my eyes, trying to picture myself terrified. However, the memory simply didn't exist. After all, I was too young to comprehend the totality of the situation and any danger to me or my family. Too innocent to appreciate that I might have seen the anxiety in my parents' faces. Jessica turned back to her book, but I remained distracted. At 23 years of age, I had already endured a lot in life. I was the first of my family born with one finger on each hand, shortened forearms, and one toe on each foot, which shocked my parents in the delivery room. It turned out what I had, I had was a genetic condition that was so rare the doctors that delivered me didn't even know what it was called. Years later, I learned it had a name, ectrodactyly. Although to this day, to me, it sounds more like a type of dinosaur <laughs> than anything else. It is simply a Greek term for missing digits. It was understandable that from the moment I arrived, my parents were consumed with fear. Would I walk? Would I run? Would I be able to pick up a fork to eat independently? Would I write? Would I be able to do everything my brothers could? The year was 69. There was no prenatal ultrasounds back then, warning my parents of the unexpected. In fact, that's probably a good thing, since although my physical differences were limited to missing fingers and toes and having shortened forearms, there is a risk my condition can also come with internal complications. Years later, when I asked my parents, they told me they believed everything would ultimately be okay. Although my appearance came as a shock, I was fortunate to have parents who were open-minded, educated, and unconditionally supportive. Although I was a bit delayed reaching some developmental milestones, eventually I would not only walk, run, and write, but also accomplish everything they had hoped and more. My parents finally realized they could let go of their initial fears for me. The next challenge, however, came from outside my family. It was the reactions from strangers to the sight of me that signaled the problems I would face throughout my life. When living, in, when living in Tehran, my parents would stroll the city with me in a carriage. 
Often people would approach us and beg for money. However, as soon as they noticed me, the baby with the deformities, their faces would turn to pity. My parents can recount incidents where beggars expressed shock and fear at the sight of me as if I were contagious and quickly backed away. As I became a young girl and we encountered more unsuspecting people throughout the Middle East and South Asia, strangers might not run away, but their eyes would turn down in pity, often accompanied by the same audible expression. Back in America, the reactions and culture were quite different. My father was a professor at the University of Illinois. After living abroad in one country, we usually returned to the US for a year or so before leaving again. In Illinois, people tended to be more reserved in their reactions. The blatant expressions of shock from the Middle East were replaced by constant but unwelcome offers of help. I get it, most people cannot comprehend doing many daily activities with only one finger on each hand. In contrast, I like to joke that if you gave me the other eight fingers today, I actually wouldn't know what to do with them. <laughs> but back home, it seems that when people encounter something pitiable, that makes them feel, that makes them uncomfortable. They generally don't know what to do or say, so the polite ones offer help. However, that's when their politeness collides with my pride. I wanted none of their help. My parents never overprotected me or treated me differently from my two brothers. So I grew up fiercely independent and determined to do everything myself, even if it took me longer. I'm not saying that I couldn't have used some help now and then, but only that I was generally not open to receiving it. That worked well for my, managing myself and my family. Yet as hard as I might try to fit in and prove myself, I never really could control the reactions of others to me. As a young child, I couldn't even explain to another kid why I looked the way I did. My father once patiently explained it to me, only to have me reply, okay, daddy, now I understand why I only have one finger, but why is it that I only have one toe? <laughs> I just didn't get it. One, once I asked my mother why some other kids, ones that I didn't know, seemed to be afraid of me. Her answer was direct and honest. Maggie, they don't understand. I think they probably fear for their own loss. Somehow that made sense to me. After all, there were times as a child that I daydreamed about the day my other fingers would grow in to join the existing two. So why wouldn't other kids see me and fear losing their own fingers, as I may have lost mine? Each of us develops our own coping mechanisms for managing relationships with strangers. As I grew up and realized the need to deal with the constant questions and fears about my appearance, I opted for the mechanism that came totally, that came most naturally, talking, <laughs> embracing, and engaging. Fortunately, I was gregarious. I delighted in making new friends, and I soon mastered the technique of turning conversations away from my disfigured hands, arms, and feet onto other topics. When dealing with other kids, I deflected away from myself and asked them endless questions about themselves. I would continue to pummel new acquaintances with questions until I found a topic they found more interesting than my body. I later discovered this works with adults, too. In short, my goal was to distract people by becoming a someone they might even like, rather than a something they didn't understand and possibly even feared. By the time we left Cairo in the early 80s and moved back to the United States, I had mastered the ability to put friends and strangers at ease. I also was committed to proving myself whenever I had the chance. I would play trombone in the marching band, become a cheerleader, learn cartwheels and gymnastics, play tennis, ride a bike, and even play a mean game of basketball. However, as my girlfriends began to get invited to school dances and discovered boys, it was time for me to face some of my other deeply rooted fears. Would boys like me? Would one ever be willing to marry me? I can't look at John when I say that. <laughs> start to tear up. <laughs> I grew self-conscious and began to hide my hands in photos. A lot. 
I prefer to see only images of myself without my deformities being visible, as if I could make sure to control how the world would always see me. At the time, I was convinced the possibility of passing along my condition genetically was out of the question. I mistakenly believed, and yes, I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, that my mom had probably eaten some bad fish, which made her sick while pregnant with me and caused this mutation. Seriously. <laughs> uh, I know that sounds ridiculous, but it was probably my coping mechanism. It did not escape me that my younger brother, Ted, didn't share my condition. So I believed, I needed to believe, it would start and end with me. Back then, before I knew any better, I'm looking at Ethan, I couldn't stand the thought of having a child like me. Although the search for love is certainly a long topic for another time, my fears were eventually disproved when I met my husband, John. By then, I had already graduated from law school and embarked on an intriguing career. Looking back, it strikes me as ironic that as accomplished as I was professionally, and although I had the good fortune of meeting a wonderful man that was willing to commit to me, I was still far from loving myself unconditionally. Come to think of it, I'm quite certain that when John and I were dating, I insisted to him that my, that my condition was not genetic. I described it as a fluke, which is a type of fish. You get the whole fish and my mom was... <laughs> and I'm sure I feared that if John thought it was genetic, he might fear having a family with me. Little did I know, but John was much more mature than I was, and he suspected from the start that it could be genetic. But it didn't matter to him because he loved me and he wanted nothing more than to commit to me unconditionally and marry me. In 2002, when we learned from the ultrasound that our unborn son would share my condition, my greatest fear was realized. Not that I was worried about the physical aspects of our condition. Unlike my own parents, we knew from my own experience that our son would be capable of accomplishing a great deal physically. Taking my own parents' lead, John and I would raise Ethan and our second son, Charlie, also born with extradactyly, with self-confidence and, and a never-say-never never attitude. Ethan arrived, and as I held his tiny single finger in my own, a new strength developed in me. I had given birth to someone with my own difference, and I loved him powerfully and unconditionally. It began to dawn on me that if I were going to love Ethan so passionately, didn't I have to love myself just as much? It would take time, and I had much to learn as a parent of a child with a difference. When Ethan was born, John's older sister advised, you must be your child's biggest advocate. Inevitable stares, innocent questions, and unsolicited offers of help would come our way, and often I would remember her words. As expected, Ethan flourished in the same way, same way I had physically. And thankfully, he is a bright boy with the sweetest disposition. All the kids in his nursery school at our local Jewish community center got used to the, kids with, the kid with only two fingers in their class. And unlike his mother, Ethan was growing up in the same town year after year. When Ethan entered the first grade, he enrolled in a larger school with many students he had never met. It was only a few days into the new year in September when I got a call from Ethan's school principal. It was actually September 11th, not 2001, but that was the day. From her tone, I immediately knew something was wrong. A group of fourth grade boys had surrounded our six-year-old at recess. This was the same principal we had visited at her request the month before school began upon learning about Ethan's physical differences. She had insisted in setting up a special needs plan for Ethan to provide him whatever special accommodations the teaching faculty presumed he needed. I can still picture the conversation vividly. Mr. and Mrs. Zucker, the 504 plan is available to Ethan, given his disability. They are developed by school teams and parents to support ed the educational needs of a student like your son. Noting my hesitation and frustration, she added, we can work together to develop the plan so it is tailored to Ethan's needs. For example, if you'd like, we can let Ethan take all his tests untimed to make sure he has the time he needs to complete each in-class assignment and exams. I reacted. Don't you all see? 
if you give him extra time on his test, he'll take it, and then he'll believe he always needs it. In truth, my parents had never asked my schools to make exceptions for me, and I've always been proud of that. But after some private negotiation with John, who convinced me that perhaps things were different now than 30 years ago, I reluctantly agreed to a modified plan. For example, the school would allow us to practice some of the physical education tasks at home that Ethan would later face in class. As we spent the evening together practicing stacking red cups, <laughs> very important to learn, I grew convinced Ethan would not benefit from this extra attention. In fact, I needed the school to understand it would more likely retard his development, if anything. Now the principal was calling me to report a bullying incident involving my son. Her voice was strained as she described in more detail how the group of boys, older boys, had backed Ethan against a tree while laughing and pointing to his small one-fingered hands, shouting as the other kids gathered around. You only have one finger. You look weird. When Ethan shoved his hands in his pockets, he began to cry and tried his best to leave. However, the boys only made a tighter circle and continued to mock him. Fortunately, a friend from Ethan's JCC nursery school forced his way through the crowd and came to Ethan's rescue. Back at home, I knew this was a pivotal moment in our lives. I had taught Ethan most of my tricks. He had finally learned to tie his shoes and ride a bike. He knew how to deflect conversations away from his physical differences by asking new acquaintances about themselves. But Ethan was not me. Although he was delightful to speak to and friendly, he was less gregarious and outgoing than I was as a small child. And although the principal had reassured us the school faculty would certainly be more attentive to ensure such an incident wouldn't be repeated, I knew it was up to me and my husband to help our son find new ways to cope with our own unique challenges. That night, after we put Ethan's younger brother, Charlie, and their baby sister, Savannah, to bed, I worked to help him understand that although he looked so different than everyone else, other kids who were taunting him most likely had their own insecurities about something we probably couldn't see. I explained to Ethan that happy kids are never mean to others. So if another children does something that makes you feel badly inside, that is because there's something about that kid he or she doesn't feel good about. Bullies need to make other kids feel badly so they can try to feel better about themselves. I also explained that because we don't know what is making those kids unhappy, it would be pointless to try and control their behavior. Instead, the only person Ethan control was himself. At my suggestion, we role played the experience on the playground. However, instead of Ethan playing himself, I had him pretend to be the bully, and I was him. Through that interaction, he saw the difference when I reacted in shame versus apathy. We practiced this repeatedly, and the more I didn't care, the more Ethan felt disempowered. Back at school, when there was another attempt in the cafeteria by the same boys, Ethan responded differently. He not only shouted loudly, but act had actually come to feel, I don't care what you think about me. The kids moved on, no longer finding pleasure in teasing our son. Fast forward to the present, and a lot has changed. Ethan is in seventh grade, Charlie is in fourth, and Savannah is in second. To our delight, they are all not only confident and thriving, but also believe that having a difference has actually turned out to be a positive thing in their lives. For example, Ethan is a fantastic basketball player and loves to play tennis. Charlie has been playing baseball, something we ourselves thought was impossible. He loves ping pong and occasionally can even beat his dad, John. <laughs> Sorry, I had to mention that, John. Um, <laughs> he also now plays the piano beautifully. Meanwhile, Savannah often reminds me that although she may not have fewer fingers and toes, her difference is that she's adopted and that her left foot is slightly larger than her right. <laughs> Whenever I say to Ethan that 
that what we have is a gift in disguise, Ethan will interrupt me and say, no, Mom. What we have is simply a gift. This past autumn, things came full circle. I received an unexpected email from Ethan's principal, who retired recently. She had spent time with a church group in Latin America, where she attended a local musical event in Guatemala. It was there the principal came across a little girl with a severe limb, limb difference of her hands, legs, and feet. She shared one of her journal entries with me, along with a photo of the little girl. She wrote, the praised dancers entered the sanctuary and took their places. A small girl with one arm and the other arm only to her elbow and legs only to her knees was carefully placed in the center of the front row of the praised dancers. As the praised dancers began their routine, the child began dancing and praising God in her own way. The joy that was expressed on her face was inspirational. Some of the participants in our vision mission trip immediately thought that the people in this church were trying to manipulate our emotions by placing this child in the front row. I saw a child who was overcoming her limitations on her own terms. But what I realized was that she did not see them as limitations, but what God has given her, and she used what was given to her to praise God. I realized that if she had appeared at my school, I would have tried to provide her with a 504 plan so she could meet the expectations of the grade level with the necessary accommodations, just like I tried to provide for Ethan, a student in my school. His mother, who has the same genetic issues as her son, shared that as she was growing up in the Middle East, she did not have any accommodations and she adjusted on her own. She wanted her son to do the same. I couldn't see how that could happen. I insisted on establishing a 504 on her terms and eventually her son, like this child, did not need any accommodations. Now, finally, I understood. A least restrictive environment really means just that. Allowing this child to dance in her own way, to use a tambourine in her own way, gave her an opportunity to meet her own full potential. To deny her the chance to display this exuberance to the glory of God would be criminal and also deny us, the congregation, of seeing pure joy from one of God's precious creations. When I reflect on the note from Ethan's principle, I can't help but think how much we each have grown since our first meeting. I no longer rush to a place of resentment when someone is trying to help me or my children. And I'm so grateful to know that based on her own authentic experience, Ethan's principle has learned that oftentimes the best way to teach a child that is different can simply be to let go and follow that child's lead. In 2011, I started a blog called Don't Hide It, Flaunt It. Over time, it has become much more than a place where I reflect on my own stories and is now my campaign to help educators, parents, teens, and children learn to accept and embrace all that makes them unique even if those differences are not seen positively by the outside world. At the site, I feature essays from people of all ages who share stories from their lives inspired by the theme, the things that make me different make me me. I call each piece a flaunt because flaunting like a peacock is a demonstration of pride and self-confidence. They include stories of individuals with their own candid description of a physical difference, or those who are parenting children with a blatant physical difference. But there are also tales from individuals, including parents similarly struggling with the judgment of strangers, such as a mother whose child is on the road to becoming a transgender, or a woman in India unable to bear children who was treated with ridicule and disgust in her village. I even had a flaunt from a wonderful man, an educator named Stuart Rakoff, who sadly lost his fight to Lou Gehrig's disease. Mr. Rakoff wrote for my site the month before he passed, since he still felt that whatever time he had left on this earth, he wanted to spend it feeling proud and grateful. Still other flaunts are about challenges that I call invisible, such as someone who is deaf, wearing cochlear implants or not, dyslexic or blind, or colorblind. Some of my favorites, however, are what I label kids' flaunts, written by children. 
Not only do I enjoy how they write with such sincerity uh, and, and intensity about having to wear eyeglasses or being the shortest kid in their class or a child of divorce, but I am also certain that this effort helps them better empathize with others they come across in and outside of their school. As I learned early in life, kids are far less likely to bull others when, again, they see them as a someone and not as something. I've been fortunate to be able to work with wonderful organizations in the United States, such as Scholastic, one of the premier education publishers in the United States to reach into classrooms across the country and with the charitable foundation of the Royal Bank of Canada, uh, my employer, who are continuing to help me expand my Flaunt SA initiative. Our efforts extend beyond the anti-bullying campaigns that seem to exist in many, if not most, schools these days. Although these messages are important, especially because so much bullying is directed at children who stand out as different. I believe the message of accepting difference is far more effective if kids actually understand each other and are in touch with their own vulnerabilities. By having students discover and express what makes them unique, they learn to connect by empathy rather than disconnect because of fear and misunderstanding. My hope is that these efforts also take flight outside the US. By encouraging all kids to discuss their differences and by nurturing the understanding that there is no real normal, kids can better relate to one another. A friend once shared with me, they believe that the opposite of love is not hate, but fear. I'm convinced the only barrier between us all is actually fear and the only real remedy is love, beginning with self-love. Our differences can be visible, like those of mine and my children's, or invisible, like countless others. But they are actually common to all. They are something to be embraced and celebrated. Now, before I close with my warm thanks to Ambassador Shapiro and his staff for letting me, allowing me to come and share my story, um, I wanted to end in two ways. One, with a favorite quote that came from Stuart Rakoff before he died. And the next is, uh, occurred to me a little bit on the fly, but when I was born, there was a woman who wrote a poem about me. Uh, and that woman is Ambassador Shapiro's mother. So I thought it would be nice to end this presentation with that poem. But before I do that, Stuart Rakoff's quote that I I embrace myself, um, is life is not about waiting for the storm to pass. It's about learning to dance in the rain.